there's a website called despair.com. And what's so funny about this website is it actually does demotivational art. So you've, you've all seen motivational art, right? So uh, you might even have some of this hung up in your, your workplace or your home office where there's like a picture of an eagle soaring and it's like, you know, some little quote at the bottom to help you be better each day, right? Well, despair.com, they do demotivational art as just a spin on being funny and humorous. And uh, there were, they were some interesting ones that caught my eye that I wanted to share with you today. So let me, let me show you the first one here. Go ahead and bring the lights down as we bring them up too. Believe in yourself because the rest of us think you're an idiot. Let's look at the next one. Perseverance, the courage to ignore the obvious wisdom of turning back. Let's look at the next one. Idiocy, never underestimate the power of stupid people in large groups. Next one. Knowledge, I believe that children are our future and that terrifies me. If you can't see it, it's two plus two equals five. Pain, pain is just weakness leaving the body. If you can't see it, that's a cat smacking a mice. Pain is just weakness leaving the body. Sometimes your spirit tags along with it. Teamwork, ensuring that your hard work can always be ruined by someone else's incompetence. And the last one, my favorite, mistakes. It could be that the purpose of your life is only to serve as a warning to others, and that's a shipwreck. The purpose of your life to serve as a warning for others. Now, I've shared a lot of stories of mishaps of my own life, and sometimes I feel like that's kind of my life story. It's, it serves as a warning to others, don't do this, right? But, but the truth is, you know, if you think about it, we've all known some people that seem to have just, just really, really, you know, bad luck. Um, things seem to go bad to worse with them, and, and there's always something happening in their life. And, and you know, as I, I thought about that, I was reminded of the passage we're going to look at today. Today we're going to look at a guy that, that had just that kind of a life. Everything seemed to go from bad to worse. If he didn't have bad luck, he'd have no luck at all. And he's a very familiar character in the Bible. His name's Joseph. And we're going to take a look this morning at his life, not only how things continue to spiral downwardly, how they would go from bad to worse, but also how he carried himself in all these different situations. How Joseph truly was this guy who had strong character, impeccable character, even when everyone else would have probably thrown in the towel and said, I give up. Joseph persevered, not just persevered, but thrived through his strong character. So today as we continue worshiping and we finish this series stronger out, we're going to take a look at this thing of character. Will you pray with me? Father God, thank you so much for the blessing of being in your house. And Lord, we pray right now as we come to this time where we open your word. Lord, we pray that you bless the reading of your word. Lord, we pray that you would help it to come alive to each of us. Father, today may each of us truly wrestle with the truth and content of your word. To put ourselves in these situations and think about our own character, our own lives, and how we are living them for you. Lord, may you be honored and glorified now as we, your people, worship you through the studying of your word. We pray all this in your son, Jesus' name. Amen. Get your Bibles. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 39. We're going to begin with verse 1, but I'm going to give you some background first. So this guy, Joseph, here's the deal. He was the youngest of, of, of all of his brothers. He was this, his dad's favored son by far. In fact, if you're a biblical scholar, you know that, that his dad lavished all kinds of uh, special treatment on him. One particular thing to note was he made him a special coat of many colors. Um, it was a very vibrant coat. Color, if you didn't know this, represented wealth and, and prosperity. And a lot of times things didn't have a lot of color to them because they were more expensive. And here, dad made his youngest son, his favorite son, this really snazzy coat and didn't make one for any of his other sons or anybody. So his, his other brothers were, were frustrated with him. They were jealous of him. They were angry towards him. And he only kind of fed into it. Um, as the Lord uh, spoke to him through dreams, he had two different dreams. Uh, the first one was where all of his brothers were bowing down and worshiping him. Um, and he comes down in the morning. He's like, oh, you won't believe I had this great dream. Now, keep in mind, the brothers are already frustrated with him. They already don't like him. They're jealous. And now he's telling them he had a dream that they're all going to be bowing down, worshiping him. 
So they're like, are you kidding me? Can you just stop talking? That kind of thing. Then he has another dream where literally same thing with his mom and dad is happening. And he's saying the same thing. And even his dad says, whoa, really? That's what you're trying to say here? And so, so Joseph was just this guy who was kind of in the moment, living the moment. He had been taught to love the one true God, Yahweh. God was clearly moving in his life. But he didn't always have the, the discernment to, to share some of his dreams and, and visions God gave him in the right way. And as a result, his brothers, the, the animosity, jealousy, and frustration just spilled over. They had all they could take. And one day they decided they were going to kill him. So his brothers decided they were going to kill him. And they, they hatched this plot. So when they all went out to work out in the fields as they're, they're leaving, they decided they were going to kill him. They grab him up, and then they, one of them starts saying, well, maybe we shouldn't kill him. Maybe we shouldn't, and as they're kind of wrestling with what to do, they throw him into a cistern, a big hole, and he can hear them talking about whether they're going to kill him or what they're going to do, and then they have the bright idea, instead of killing him, let's sell him into slavery, let's make a little bit of money for ourselves. And sure enough, they see a, a, a slavery a caravan coming by, so they pull him out of this cistern, and they take him, and they sell him to the slave trader on the way to Egypt. They make a little bit of money. Now, to make a good excuse so that they can tell their dad what happened to him, they take that real snazzy coat he had, and they killed an animal and poured blood all over it. And then they took the coat back and said, Dad, uh, Joseph's dead, an animal tore him apart. Now, can you just stop for a second? That is the cruelest thing ever, right? To go and tell a parent that your son is dead when he's not dead, but then also as brothers to plot to kill him, then decide instead you're going to make a little bit of money and sell him into slavery. Now, you've got to understand something. Slavery was, was this horrific thing. It's just like what you would see in, in movies and, and going all the way back to ancient times. The master had complete power over you, 100% power over you, your life and everything and your death and everything in between. That's what happened. Literally, if you put yourself in the moment, Joseph got up one day, got up one day, went out with his brothers, went from, they're going to kill me, they're going to throw me in a cistern, now they're going to sell me into slavery to being shackled, sold into slavery, shackled, and on his way in, a, in this caravan to Egypt and, and, and walking. Can you imagine what would have gone through his mind that night as he went to sleep? That was a bad day, wasn't it? That was a bad day. And the truth is, as we talk about this even, we've all had bad days, but not one of us have ever had anything that even comes close to that. I mean, we've had at different times different uh, struggles and, and even friendships, relationships, maybe family, extended family. But I guarantee you, not one of you in the room ever got up one morning and the rest of your family said, hey, we're going to kill you today. And then someone's like, wait, that would be bad. Let's, not, let's sell them into slavery forever. Think about that. that is a, that's a bad moment. If you have endured that, it's safe to say that your faith would be rocked. Joseph, being somebody that, that worshiped God, would have been walking behind, uh, shackled with other slaves, going to be sold, probably thinking, God, where are you? You just gave me these visions where everybody's bowing down. Now I'm in shackles. I'm sold into slavery. My family doesn't love me. There's a, a, a place in all of this where you start to think that it would have been so easy for Joseph to say, enough's enough. God, you turned your back on me. I'll turn my back on you. Or at the very minimum, begin to make poor choices thinking my life's over. I'm a slave now, it's over. It doesn't matter what I do. That's where we pick up. Sold into slavery, arrives in Egypt. Genesis chapter 39, begin at verse 1. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph and he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and, and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. 
Now, let's just stop here for a second. So Joseph sold into slavery. He's on the slave block. They're coming by inspecting. It would have been a demeaning thing, checking your, your teeth, looking at everything like you were an animal. He's sold, still probably in shock of what's happening. We don't know how many days it took him to get to Egypt. We don't know what, what transpired from the time he was sold to the time he was bought. But it's safe to say it wasn't a pleasure trip and that his life had been completely turned upside down. He's sold and he goes to Potiphar's house, and now he has a choice. He's a slave. He's got a master who literally holds his life in his hand. He could decide, I'm done with you. And, and he's literally treated as property. And in, the, in, in that situation, Joseph begins to serve. He begins to do what his master asks him to do. Now, what's interesting about that is there's, there's some case to be made that some of us might be willing to, to just give up at that point. To, to not, not do a good job, to do the bare minimum, to not excel, to not whatever task you're given, to, to just get by with it. But what we find is Joseph does his very best. He always does his very best. In fact, part of Joseph's character was to do his very best, to do his very best in all things. Now, I want to make sure that we all understand that Joseph is just a normal person like you and me. He's not superhuman. He doesn't have this super dose of faith. All he has is faith, just like you and I. And he chooses to live his life in a certain way regardless of the situations around him. He chooses to live his life with character. He chooses to to live his life above board even when the situations around him get difficult and he feels squeezed because certainly he felt squeezed in this moment. And as he serves Potiphar, everything he touches excels, and he keeps doing a good job. So Potiphar keeps giving him more and more and more. And before you know it, the Scripture says, Joseph's put as Potiphar's attendant. What that means is he was second in command of his whole house. He was in charge of everything. He was in charge of other slaves. He was in charge of everything except Potiphar's wife. In fact, the Scripture says that Potiphar didn't concern himself with anything but the food he was going to eat. That's a big rise to power. We don't know exactly how long it took for that to happen, but it happened. He went from almost being killed by his brothers, being sold into slavery, to now rising to these ranks. And you have to think that while being a slave was still bad, it wasn't free. There's a master that held your life and everything that went with it in his hands. You have to also think that there was a point where Joseph started saying, okay, this is better than it was. I've risen to the highest rank that I can as a slave. I'm living in Potiphar's care. I'm taking care of everything in his house. And he would have been treated pretty well, too. So he's looking around thinking, I've kind of arrived. Here I am. This is good. I can handle this. Still a slave, not ideal, but he can handle it. Look what happens next. Now, Joseph was well-built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Now, let's get some perspective on this as well. So here Joseph's in charge of everything. He's doing a great job. Everything is taken off. In the house, in the field, everything. He's Potiphar's attendant. But, but Potiphar's wife starts to take a liking to him and begins to come on to him. Certainly comes on to him in a private setting because if she did it in a public setting, that would get her in trouble too. So she's constantly throughout the house when they're, when they're in the vicinity of each other, she's coming up to him and she's wanting him to do something that would be dishonorable. She's wanting him to do something that would be horrible. Certainly Potiphar would not be on board with this. But she's wanting Joseph, or Joseph to, to do this thing and she's pressuring him and that's his master's wife. So now Joseph starts to find himself in a difficult situation yet again. I'm serving my master, I'm in this great place, but now I'm really stressed out. If she keeps doing this and Potiphar hears about it, I'm going to get in some trouble. 
and he starts kind of trying to figure out what to do. She keeps pressuring him, and he begins to talk to her about why that's not okay. And he talks about all the things Potiphar's put him in charge of. He talks about why this wouldn't be right. He's in charge of everything except you and, and that kind of thing. But I want to point out something you may have missed in reading this account before. As you look through, he's, he's making all this case for, for why he shouldn't do this. But notice what he says when he comes down to, how then should I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? He says, how then, he's talking to, to Potiphar's wife in a private situation, and he says, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? He doesn't say sin against Potiphar. He doesn't say do something against Potiphar. Certainly, again, Potiphar wouldn't be on board with this. But he says, and sin against God. He's talking to this woman who's trying to pressure him into going to bed with her, and he begins to talk about God in this private setting. This guy who was almost killed by his brothers, sold into slavery, now risen to these ranks. Let me tell you something. If there was ever a case for someone to say, you know what, in this situation, I'm going to go to bed with her. I don't care anymore. Maybe he could have even started to feel prideful. Look how powerful I'm at, I am now. I'm in charge of all this. Surely I can do that. As long as Potiphar doesn't know about it, who cares? But instead, what he starts to talk about is this thing of sin against God. He begins to talk about God, who he learned about as a boy, who he's now talking about in the midst of this difficult situation that's come on him yet again. And he says, how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? What we see is the, the compass for Joseph's character. We see that for Joseph, what determined what he did in his actions day to day, it was about what was pleasing to God, what would be sinful to God, and what would be pleasing to God. That was the, the direction of his character at all times. That's why when he was put over a task as a slave, he did the best he could. He did all things as unto the Lord. And we find in this setting, he's now set up where, where he's being pressured. And instead of giving in, instead of saying, woe is me, God, where have you been for me? He still says, I'm not going to do this. This would be a wicked thing, and it would be sin to my God. Powerful, powerful moment. Let's keep reading verse 11. One day we went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. So here's what happens. He starts avoiding her completely. He goes in to do his duties, and one day he's in there just working. And the Scripture says that, that she kind of cornered him and caught him by his cloak. Caught him, grabbed him by his clothing. She's got him now. She's got him cornered. She's been, been trying to, to get with him for a long time. Now she's got him cornered. Nobody's in the house. And Joseph, instead of giving in even then, he begins to try to squeeze and wiggle away from her. And the only way he can do it is he wiggles right out of his clothes. Then he's standing in the house naked. So he flees. He runs out. As soon as he runs out of the house naked, there's a story to be told. Everybody's wanting to know, why is Joseph coming out of the house naked? That has never happened before. And immediately Potiphar's wife wants to get ahead of the story. So she starts yelling rape. He tried to rape me. He came in and tried to attack me and rape me. And immediately Potiphar hears about this. It spreads all over. Potiphar's furious, so he has Joseph thrown into Pharaoh's prison. Understand this. Potiphar could have had him killed. Could have killed him himself. Could have tortured him to death. But you see a, a respect level that Potiphar had for Joseph that he wasn't going to kill him. But instead, he sentenced him to death in Pharaoh's prison. So here again, Joseph goes from this high position to now this low position. It went from bad to worse. And we find even in that setting, Joseph's character is now going to come into play. What do you do when you're thrown in jail and there's no hope of getting out? What do you do? Most of us, we despair. We fall apart. Instead, Joseph, even in Pharaoh's prison, begins to, to try to help, begins to try to make a difference, begins to try to be a servant there, and he begins to get a good reputation. He begins to be thought of as somebody of high character, and he begins to rise through the ranks again. And to, to kind of fast forward a little bit, we find that there's some dreams that Pharaoh has. 
He calls everyone together to try to interpret the dreams. Nobody can. But through other dream interpretations that Joseph had while in jail with other prisoners, it's brought to Pharaoh's attention. He says, bring this guy Joseph in front of me. And Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dream and says, hey, there's going to be this great famine that's going to come. And before that famine, the famine's going to last seven years. But before that, there's going to be seven years of abundance. And you've got to store up all the food that you can to get through that. Pharaoh's overwhelmed, and he goes, you are promoted. You're promoted to my second in command. You take care of all the, the preparations for all of this. And we find that Joseph goes from being a brother who's about to be killed, sold into slavery, the attendant to Potiphar who's thrown into Pharaoh's jail, who once again rises all the way through the ranks and is now second in command of all of Egypt. And in that setting, by him, him being obedient to what God was laying on his heart as far as dream interpretation, by him having a, a good character, being somebody that was of great character, no matter what, he was, what situation he was in, you find that now he's in this position of power where people did bow down to him. Where as this famine began to play out, if they stored it all up, all the nations would come and get food from them, including his own family the very brothers who were going to kill him and sell him into slavery. And as a result of all of this, God provides for this family so they don't die out of starvation because God made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And even through Joseph, he, he fleshes out those promises. What I want you to understand as we look at all this, though, this isn't just a story of someone who went through a bad time. This is a story of someone who is deliberate in living their life with character. That they had a compass, they had a direction for every decision that they were going to make. He wasn't perfect, he was just like you and I. He was someone of great character. Right now, before we go any further, I want every single one of you in the room not to think of a historical figure, but think of someone who is alive today who has great character. Go. Someone who has great character. Even as I ask that question, some of you stumbled. Some of you in your mind, you went to, who, wait, wait, now, not that you kind of stumbled around a little bit. Let me throw it out a different way. Let me throw it out a different way. If I asked that same question in Mainville, in Lebanon, and throughout Cincinnati and Southwest Ohio, and I kept asking it, would anybody ever mention your name? Not your families, not your spouses, not your kids. Would your name come to their mind as somebody of great character? Because great character isn't dependent on situations. It's not. In fact, great character is seen most visibly in difficult situations. When someone's unwilling to compromise. Because compromise starts this slow decay and decline of this thing of character. And the reason we struggle sometimes, the reason when I ask, mention, name, name someone of great character, the reason we struggle is because so many times people have small moments of compromise that begin to affect the entire body of the character that makes them them. We need to watch out for the small compromises. We need to wage war against them. The truth about character, number one. True character is displayed when all alone, when no one else is around. When no one is looking over your shoulder, the decisions you make show the character that you have. What am I talking about? When nobody knows, when, when nobody knows what's happening. See, Joseph had this moment, he wasn't all alone, he's with Potiphar's wife, but no one else was around. No one else was around. He could have said, you know what, I am going to sleep with you, who cares? Look at my life. He could have said, look at what prominence I've risen to, I deserve this. He could have done that. You know, in modern times, there's, there's all kinds of moments for us to have questionable character. When no one else is around, do you ever try to get on a computer or some, some electronic device and watch pornography? Some of you in the room do that. That's compromise. You think no one else is around. Who cares? It's me. Some of you are in the business world, maybe in sales. No one sees what you're doing, but, but maybe sometimes you're tempted to pad your expense report. Get a little bit more out of it, a little bump that week. I know some people do it. Statistically, some of you in this room do that. That's compromise. You see, true character is on display when no one else is around. When no one else is around, that's when your character is on full display. 
That's when it's important for each of us to look long and hard at ourselves, look deep in our heart, and try to come to an understanding of who are we? Really, who are we? Not who do we tell people we are, not who do we try to act like at different times. Who are we? True character's on display when we're all alone. Second, character may cost you now, but it always pays off in time. Character may cost you now, but it always pays off in time. Listen to how it turned out for Joseph. Genesis 41, begin verse 41. So Joseph, so Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command, and men shouted before him, Make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. You see, good character may cost you in the moment, but it will certainly pay off in the end. It will pay off in time. And I want you to understand something. I'm not saying that if we try to live our lives with character today, that every single one of us are going to be second in command of a nation. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not even saying by living with character that that any of us will have one extra penny put in our bank account. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is having a reputation as someone who is above board, somebody who is of great character. That is exceptional. That is rare. That is a gem to be sought after. You begin to live your life in this way, and you recognize that true character is on display when you're all alone, when you recognize that it may cost you. That means at times you may not be able to do what everyone else is doing. At times, sometimes people may make fun of you. At times, people may pressure you to do things, and you may say, no, nope, I'm not going to do it. And this, has, this, this character thing comes into play in every single area of your life. Your employment, how you are at school, how you are on a sports team, how you are with your spouse, how you are with your kids. Every single area of your life, this thing of character comes into play. And while sometimes you may have to sacrifice, at the end of your life, when you're breathing your last breath, it will be so freeing to you to know that you did your very best throughout your lifetime to live a life of great character as the Lord led you. That is rare. That is very rare. I've had the opportunity, the unfortunate opportunity to be with a number of people in their final hours in this world before they die. It is so rare when someone finishes strong. And you know who finishes strong. Because there's a sense of, there's a sense of pride. There's a sense of, of, yep, there's an unknown coming, but I know who's waiting for me in the unknown. And there's not this sense of all this regret. Let me tell you something. What I hear more times than not is regret, regret, regret. And that regret always comes from from moments when their character was compromised. They wish they would have done it differently way back when. But when they compromise here, it set them up for here and here. And before you know it, their life began to go on this unsteady path where compromise comes so easy. Third and final truth about character. Not only is true character displayed when all alone, not only does character cost us now, but it always pays off in time. The greatest way to have strong character is to make pleasing God your top priority. The greatest way to have strong character is to make pleasing God your top priority. Joseph, when he was being pinched with difficulty with Potiphar's wife, he said, how can I do this wicked thing and sin against God? If you begin to let that be your compass in the decision-making process in your day-to-day affairs, you will begin to live a life of great character. And God will bless that and will use that and other people will be drawn to you. But compromise, even just a little, has a huge price to pay. January 16, 2003, the Columbia Space Shuttle took off. 82 seconds into its flight with seven astronauts on board, a foam piece about the size of a suitcase broke loose from the fuselage. It came back and struck the left wing, and the NASA engineers and and everybody on the ground, they saw something happen, but they couldn't figure out exactly what it was. That foam piece broke off and hit the wing, and it it damaged the, the thermal... Uh, housing on that wing to protect it from heat. 
The Columbia Space Shuttle went on into space and did its mission for about two weeks. Great success with that. While they were up there, the engineers and, and different people on the ground, they did their best to try to sort out what had happened. They tried to look. They tried to assess. And to the best of their knowledge, they, they thought it was, it was a small compromise. The, the hull, the, the thermal hull had been compromised. It was a small one. They thought that it would be insignificant. And quite honestly, they, figured, they, they started thinking, how in the world are we going to fix this anyway? At the end of this mission, the Columbia Space Shuttle began to, to re-enter the atmosphere. And over a Texas, Louisiana region, the world watched in horror as it completely exploded before our eyes. Many of you remember this vividly. I remember it, much like the Challenger. I remember this. Seven astronauts died immediately. NASA was floored. In fact, they shut the whole program down for two years and revamped everything. All because of what they deemed as a small compromise. This is how character works in our lives. Something small. No one sees it. Nobody knows. It doesn't matter. One small compromise begins to lead us down a path. And before you know it, you don't know which ends up. Even if it's not something that happens right away. Even sometimes it can take weeks, months, years. But it begins to damage your character. Your character begins to go off track. And when you notice character that's damaged more than any other time is when heat and difficulty and pressure come in. And literally our lives, just like that space shuttle, explode and implode. What we each need to do is recognize how important it is to be strong in character, to protect our character, to live lives that are above board, to do all things as unto the Lord, to, to live lives with purpose. Because when we do that, the Lord will bless, the Lord will work through us. To live our lives not so that, that we want to have people look at us and say, oh, of great character. What we want them to say of us is, is great Christian, great servant of the Lord. But a byproduct of that is always, you can't escape it, great character. It always is. So here's another final question. Scale of 1 to 10. 10 being the best. What kind of character do you have? Someone watched over your shoulder all the time. No one else is around. What kind of character do you have? And again, here's the scary thought. That's exactly what God does. He knows everything that goes on, both in your life and in your thought life. Live lives that are worthy of Him. Live lives that use what He has to say in our lives as the compass and the direction. And you'll be well on your way to live in a life of great character. I'm going to say a prayer in just a second. We're going to have some deacons come down here at the front. If you're here today and you just want to pray, you just want to pray for whatever reason, come down to the front. Go to the, go to the steps on the side. Just come and you can pray. It's open for that. If you're here today and you're struggling and you're feeling the Lord uh, press you because you recognize that your character has been so destroyed, understand that you can make a decision today and begin to rebuild that. You can change that. Whatever God asks you to do, you just do it. If you're here today and you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, may you have the courage and strength today to step out and talk to one of these deacons and be changed forever. Let's pray together as our deacons come. Father God, thank you so much for the blessing of this account of Joseph. As we get a glimpse into his character, Lord, it, it challenges each of us. Lord, we all struggle at different times and in different areas. And, and Father, we pray right now that you would just reveal to us any area of our life that, that compromise has happened. Lord, reveal to us any, any area that we're struggling in that, Lord, we may not even be aware. And give us the courage and the strength to just confess that to you. Lord, thank you for loving us the way that you do. Thank you for constantly giving us an opportunity to be picked up, dust off, and to be right walking with you again. You are amazing. Thank you for your love. Lord, we also pray right now for anybody in this room that doesn't know your son, Jesus, as Savior. Give him the courage and the strength now to step out and be changed forever. We pray all this in your son, Jesus' name.